So let me start by, so this lecture, lecture number two, uh, so it's titled, it's applications um, to non-commutative geometry. Okay, and let me just recall you the theorem from last time. So last time, so little k was a perfect base field um, of characteristic p, p greater or equal than zero. And the theorem, the very last theorem was that if we start with a smooth proper scheme, then uh, we can consider conjectures over X or their non-commutative counterparts over the perfect complexes on X. And these are in fact equivalent for any conjecture that I described, the one of Grotendieck, of Wojewodski, of Bailinson, of Vale, and all these variants of the Tate conjecture. And the goal of today's lecture will be to explore this equivalence towards non-commutative geometry. And next time tomorrow, we'll explore this equivalence towards uh, classical geometry. Okay, let me start with uh, a definition. Uh, a definition of what is an additive invariant. Um, so this is simply a functor on DG categories towards an additive category, so D it's additive, and satisfies two properties. So first of all, um, it sends Morit equivalences. So if you have F a Morit equivalent, uh, then uh, this invariant send it to an isomorphism. Okay, so it's defined on all DG categories, but in fact, it only depends on the underlying uh, Morita class. And the uh, second property is suppose that you have two DG categories, A and B, and you have a, a bimodule, so an A, B bimodule, then out of this data, you can construct a new DG category, which I denote by T, A, B, and then B, the, uh, the bimodule, which is simply you put your original category A and B, you do this disjoint union, and then on this direction, so homes in this direction, you use the A, B bimodule, and you don't have homes in this direction. So you see that uh, in this category, you have an inclusion of A and B inside of this category. And you ask that these two maps, these two inclusion maps, that they give rise to an isomorphism on your, um, on your additive category D. So this makes sense. You are going towards an additive category. And there are a lot of examples of additive invariants, for example, algebraic K theory, um, cyclic homology, um, topological U shield homology, um, etc., and uh, etc., and also all its variants all its different variants give rise to additive invariants. And I should mention, well, this category is somehow a categorification of an upper triangular matrices. So you somehow, this property is telling you that in fact your invariant does not see extensions. It doesn't depend on the extension that you have from A to B. It treats all this category just as a direct sum. And now you can ask for the existence of a universal uh, functor with this property. And that functor actually exists and it's very concrete. You can look at uh, the following very concrete category. Uh, so H and O little zero. So this is defined as follows. So you on objects, uh, 
you just consider all DG categories. Okay, on the home spaces between two DG categories, what you do is you look at the K0 group of a certain category rep AB. What is this rep AB? This rep AB uh, is by definition uh, a subcategory of those bimodules uh, in the drive category of AB bimodules that are finite on the right in the sense that if you look at the corresponding bimodule B on the right, it is compact. Okay, so you have this finiteness assumption on the right. And the composition in this category, it is uh, just uh, tensoring bimodules. It's induced by tensoring bimodule. Okay, something very concrete. And it comes equipped with a functor. So um, we have the following functor towards this category. Let's call it U, U of universal. Um, that does nothing on, on objects, the category goes to itself. And if you have a DG functor from A to B, what you can do is to look at B uh, by where B acts on the right on itself and it acts A acts on B on the left via this F. So I'll denote like this. And so this is a AB by module and you look at the corresponding class in this K0. And the theorem, so the First theorem says the following. So if you have uh, given any uh, additive category uh, D, then uh, what you can do is look at functors which are uh, additive. So additive functors uh, from this additive category towards D. You, whenever you have one of those, you can pre-compose with U, and that gives rise to a, 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 an additive invariant uh, going from DG categories to D. And this uh, induced functor, it's an equivalence. So in other words, this is saying that this very concrete and precise functor, it is the universal additive invariant, okay? So all invariants, additive invariants, will factor uniquely throughout this one. And uh, since yesterday we talked about uh, uh, the Sharn character, let me just mention, uh, so we actually use the Sharn character to define a homological equivalence. So here is just a remark saying that, well, the Sharn characters follow uh, uh, automatically from this theorem because suppose that you have uh, this, for example, this additive invariant given by periodic cyclic homology, so with values in uh, Z2 graded uh, capital uh, little k, so it's the same base field, then uh, it's additive, so it will factor um, uh, um, throughout this uh, universal I interrupted you. We have a question. I can't read which one is the universal additive invariant. Uh, I think on the left hand side. Uh, you cannot read, you don't understand which one is the universal one? Uh, yes, the universal one, one is the universal additive invariant. Yeah, the, the universal additive invariant is this functor. Yeah, possibly, a, possibly, uh, possibly uh, small font, something like that. Uh, does it have uh, a name? Another question. Yeah, I'm calling it U, U of universal additive invariant. Is this very concrete functor? Any other one will factor on this one in a unique way. That uh, is and, the... and my own question, sorry. Uh, and this U also satisfies universal property with respect to uh, localization the uh, sequences of DG categories, I, I, I guess. No, no, I'm just, no, this talk is entirely in the pure setting. I'm not considering this kind of phenomenon. Okay. So it, what it satisfies is this property here, uh, two, and this property here, it's another way to phrase it, is that you have a split short is X sequences become split short is X sequences. 
we are in the pure setting, okay? So there's, I'm not talking yeah, so about- Everything's please here, thank you. Um, and so here you see it's additive, so it actually will factor. So uh, the only remark is that then you can look at the induced morphism um, between the, the most simplest object that you have, which is the, the object uh, base field toward your favorite DG category. And this uh, functor gives you a, a morphism in this direction towards HP of the base field and HP of your A. But then you just observe that, well, this left-hand side is the K0 of A, and this right-hand side is the periodic cyclic homology, the positive part. And this induced map, it is the churn character. So you get for free the churn characters out of this universal property. Just a remark, because I've used these churn characters in the previous lecture. Can I interrupt with a quick question? Yes, of course. Um, so this universal gadget is on all, all DG categories. All, all of them now, yes. So um, it includes things like uh, the DG category of coherent sheaves on some scheme. Yes. For example. So in that case, the K naught would just be the, the K naught of coherent sheaves. Yes, would be the G theory, the G zero the G theory. theory. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. And in the next uh, blackboard, I'm going to make a restriction to smooth proper things. Yes. Oh, great. Thank you. So now, uh, so now I, I'm going to restrict myself to the smooth proper DG categories that I defined yesterday in the sense of Maxim Konzevich. And this uh, uh, gives rise to this notion of uh, non-commutative charm motives. Um, so it, they are defined as follows. So I, I write n chow over my base field. By definition, they are the idempotent completion of, uh, of what? And so I go inside this category here, inside this category, and I just uh, look at those objects in here um, that are smooth and proper. And now um, I still have a functor, as Mark was saying, but now defined solely on the smooth proper DG categories towards this, uh, this category. And some facts uh, about this construction. Well, uh, first of all, the home spaces uh, in this category uh, between any two objects um, so in the, that category it was given by this K0 of rep, but if this is smooth and proper, this becomes just the, the K0 of bimodules. Uh, second observation is that this category, it's in fact a um, uh, rigid tensor category. So uh, if you take an object and it's dual, it's given by the opposite uh, DG category. And moreover, if you have a, any ring of coefficients, any commutative ring of coefficients, you can look at non-commutative Chow motives with coefficients in that ring R. Uh, and so the important, that's, that are facts, and another important fact that will be a key for us today, is that if you have uh, any non-commutative Chow motive with rational coefficients, then we can phrase the conjectures from last lecture to, to this one uh, with T, with C being any one of these conjectures. Um, so in particular, in such a way that when you do the, the conjecture for U of A, uh, then you get the conjecture that we define last time for A. Okay? 
so in, in what regards the tape conjecture here, uh, we actually need uh, to work in the uh, with the integral uh, uh, non-commutative Chow motive. But this is a, a bit technical and will not play a role in this lecture, so you can skip. Uh, so what does this tell us is that, in fact, now what is the idea coming out of this fact is that now if we would be able to understand the non-commutative motive um, with rational coefficients uh, of something, then we maybe we could say something about uh, the corresponding conjecture. And this is what I'm uh, trying to explore today. So let's see some, uh, some computations. So the, the first computations So let's uh, talk first about twisted sheaves. Sorry, twisted schemes. So there I have this result with uh, Michel Vandenberg um, saying the following. So suppose that you have a smooth um, proper scheme and um, you have a, a sheaf of Azumai algebras. Okay, over X. Uh, then um, it turns out that uh, the non commutative motive. So, one thing that you can do is you can look at um, uh, the non commutative motive of X with rational coefficients and also the non commutative motive of uh, X, but twisted by F, by this sheaf of Azumai algebras, and it turns out that they are isomorphic. So the, the result is, of course, much more general. You don't need smoothness and all this. And also, uh, it holds as long as you invert the rank of F. You don't need, actually, to go to Q coefficients. And as a corollary, immediate corollary is that the conjectures are, in fact, insensitive to this to this twisting, so so when we when you twist, the conjecture is is just the conjecture of X itself, right? So here I'm using the theorem from last time. Okay, so when you twist a scheme in terms of these conjectures, nothing change. And uh, for example, uh, if we consider division algebras, so suppose that. Uh, you have a division algebra, a finite dimensional division algebra. Um, so uh, over our base field, so you can look at its center. So its center will be a finite dimensional field extension. So this is the, the center. And then uh, as a particular case, so you know that this is a central simple algebra over L. So you know that the non-commutative conjecture of your division algebra, it is just the classical conjecture on spec L, and so as a consequence, uh, all these conjectures, so you can get as a corollary that this conjecture for D always holds. So I'm not, uh, okay, so everything works for division algebras because the conjectures are just conjectures for the finite field extension. In that case, the classical ones, all of them are known to, to hold. So it's just a, an example. Another important computation is uh, what happens with semi-orthogonal decompositions. Um, so suppose it's a fact, so it's somehow uh, more or less a reformulation of additivity that I uh, uh, defined uh, five minutes ago. So suppose that you have two DG categories inside another one, and in such a way that when you take the H0, um, when you pass to the H0, you get a semi orthogonal decomposition in the sense of Bondal or Lov. So uh, these categories generate the entire category, and there are no homes in the graded sense in 
one of the directions. So there are no homes uh, in one of the directions. I'm sorry, um, a question. Uh, yes? Can I think about these categories of non-commutative motives as the exact uh, same things as in the paper of Bloomberg, Gebner, uh, Tboade? Yes, I mean, uh, all the, there uh, we phrase everything in the language of infinity categories. And uh, we were in, uh, using uh, uh, slightly different properties. We were using, as you mentioned, localization and imposing a category that in that case would be triangulated, saying that these short exact sequences of Drinfeld become triangles in this triangulated category, etc. But here I'm just in the pure setting. Okay, because uh, I want to work with smooth proper things. Why? Because these conjectures were formulated for smooth proper things. I don't need to go any further. So if you want this thing, it embeds in what you are saying. Okay, but uh, so a reformulation of additivity is just saying that when you have a, a, a semi-orthogonal decomposition, uh, the motive is even integral. The motive of A is the motive of B, direct sum with the motive of C, and so is also true with rational coefficients. And uh, as a corollary, we get as a corollary that the, the conjectures for A, it's equivalent to the conjecture for B plus the conjecture for C. Whenever we have this situation, this is what happens with the conjectures. So let me give an example. For example, uh, of Calabria uh, DG categories. Uh, so suppose that you have uh, an hypersurface in PN. Uh, and so we have a question from Mark. Is yes. draw the full subcategory of dualizable objects in the larger category uh, home star uh, because it's uh, difficult to read the boards. Uh, could you write uh, there? Th there, I imagine, no? The, the rigidity. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can just say it. So you have this category where you have the full K naught of rep is the homs, yeah. and then you have this smooth proper guys inside there. Yes. Is that the full category of just the dualizable objects in the larger okay. category? If you work at, if you look at DG categories up to Morita equivalents, the dualizable objects are the smooth proper ones. And so what I'm, you know, what I'm doing is just grabbing those and taking the full subcategory of the one with rep restricted to those objects. Great, thank you. So it's, it's basically the answer is yes, more or less. Um, so let's take an hypersurface. Okay, of degree uh, um, less or equal than n plus one. Uh, in that case, there is this beautiful work of Kuznetsov um, saying the following. So if you look at perfect complexes on this hypersurface, uh, inside of it, you can look at these line bundles uh, going until uh, O of n uh, minus the degree of x. And then you can look at the orthogonal complement that appears here. So the, what is missing, something uh, pretty abstract, but it turns out that this category, it's in fact a Calabiao uh, of dimension of uh, fractional dimension. So it's Calabiao of dimension uh, N uh, plus one uh, degree of X minus two, and then over degree of X. So another way to explain what I'm saying here is just what I'm saying is that if you look at the self functor, so any smooth proper DG category comes equipped with the self functor. Uh, so if you look at the, the self functor and you compose it uh, this number of times, what you get is the suspension functor uh, composed uh, this number of times. Um, degree of x minus two. So as a consequence of this semi-orthogonal decomposition, you get as a corollary uh, that the, the non-commutative conjecture for this piece here, it's in fact equivalent to the classical conjecture for your hypersurface. You see, uh, 
the, this category and perfect complexes of X are very different. This is even a fractional Calabi-Yau. It, it is not e equivalent to any category of a scheme. Its motives, uh, you see, are even different. But then in terms of the, of the conjectures, nothing changes, okay? So for whenever you have a hypersurface for which you know the conjectures, you know the conjecture for this kind of non-commutative gadget, purely non-commutative gadget. Okay, so let's see another example of semi-orthogonal decompositions coming from root stocks. Um, so root star. So here the setting is as follows. I'm looking at a smooth proper, as usual, K skin. So this can be relaxed, but I want to work with smooth proper things, okay? Uh, of dimension D. And I have, uh, in, inside of it, I have a smooth, uh, uh, effective uh, Cartier divisor. And then I have an integer, which I assume to be invertible in the base field. And then out of this data, I can build uh, a root stack. So I, I can write a stack like this, uh, which comes equipped with a map towards X. And what is the idea is that, well, here you have your X and your Z, and upstairs you have your X and your Z. So this is a, the lingma for stack, and which is branched over X, is branched on this divisor, and the stabilizer here at every point is given by the nth roots of unity. And then outside of the divisor, it is a, a scheme-like type uh, uh, stack, okay? And uh, for this kind of objects, there is a theorem of Ishii and Ueda uh, that uh, there exist fully faithful um, uh, functors uh, uh, going from the perfect complexes on the divisor towards perfect complexes on your stack. And this for every I between one and uh, n minus one in such a way that we have the semi-orthogonal decomposition of the perfect complexes on my stack given by all this uh, all these pieces and then one extra piece, uh, piece, piece uh, coming from the perfect complexes on X and this functor is also uh, fully faithful. So as a, as a corollary, as a corollary, we get that, uh, in fact, the conjecture, the non-commutative conjecture for the root stack, it's equivalent just to the ordinary conjecture for our underlying scheme, plus the conjecture for the divisor. Okay, so uh, for example, just a, uh, 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 low dimensional example, so this conjecture uh, actually holds, so it holds uh, when, for example, when the dimension uh, is less or equal than two, this for the uh, Grothendieck and Wojewalski conjecture for dimension less or equal to one for uh, uh, the Bailinson and the Tate conjectures. And uh, of course, it holds for any dimension for the veil conjecture. So for the non commutative veil conjecture holds for root stocks. Okay. Um, so uh, this is telling you that, in fact, the, the nth roots, the n, is not playing a role in the conjectures. Okay. It's playing a role in the dimension of the semi orthogonal decomposition, but not in the conjectures. Yes? This is the previous example in Calabria or DG algebra. So you took a hypersurface and here you took a Cartier divisor. So it seems kind of both of our kind of hypersurfaces. So is it related? It's just a guess. Uh, because this is Cartier divisor is in effectively some hyper. Uh, 
I mean, uh, not not really, not really. So let me give another interesting uh, computation. Uh, coming from uh, global orbifolds. Uh, so again, it's the same setting. You have some uh, smooth uh, proper scheme um, of dimension D. And now you have a finite group uh, uh, of order M. And I'm assuming that N is invertible on the base field. And uh, this group is acting on X. So I can, uh, this data gives rise to, to this global orbifold. And then uh, it turns out that for this kind of stacks, uh, the theorem again with uh, Michel is that uh, in fact, a non-commutative motive of, of this stack uh, it's in fact a direct summon um, of uh, here. You can look something that is purely commutative. You just look at the subgroups uh, contained in G, which are cyclic, cyclic subgroup. So the sum over all cyclic subgroups uh, of the motive of the the part that is fixed under this action. So as a, as a corollary, so you see that here is just a, a scheme. So as a corollary, you get that, well, if you know these conjectures for these uh, cyclic uh, groups, uh, these classical conjectures for these cyclic groups, then they will imply this non-commutative version for this stack. And again, uh, it turns out that, well, uh, as a, a low dimensional example, this will work uh, exactly the same way. So this, this corollary will have exactly the same corollary for now the global law default stack, okay? And uh, moreover, we have other, uh, for example, another possible cases where the conjecture holds. Uh, is uh, when you are in, in characteristic zero and you have an abelian variety um, and the group that is acting on X, it's acting by uh, group homomorphisms. Uh, then in that case, you get that this conjecture of Grothendieck, the non-commutative version holds. Okay because you don't leave the world of abelian varieties. And for those, you know that the classical conjecture of Grothendieck for abelian varieties is true. Okay, so maybe one final example where we are able to, comp to prove the conjecture in, uh, in, full, in full generality is this uh, example of uh, Uh, finite dimensional algebras or DG algebras. So we can look at the finite dimensional uh, even DG uh, K algebras. So you, we fix a, a finite dimensional uh, K algebra uh, of finite global dimension. So we, a uh, little k is a perfect field. So finite dimensional gives me the properness. Finite global dimension is exactly the smoothness. And uh, for example, uh, suppose that uh, the algebra can be given by a, a quiver algebra of a certain quiver module of an admissible idea. So if this is a, 
a finite quiver um, without uh, oriented cycles, then uh, this quiver algebra is finite dimensional. And if this is a, an admissible uh, ideal, um, then you have a finite global dimension. Okay, and the, these are examples, but a uh, remark, an interesting remark of Gabriel, Pierre Gabriel, is that when you, when the, the field is algebraically closed, in fact, all algebras are of this form up to Morit equivalent. So up to Morit equivalence is always given by a quiver with relations, okay? But now what can you do is, okay, suppose that we have one of those, we can look at uh, its quotient by the Jacobson radical of A, let's call it B. So this is the largest semi-simple quotient of A. So I can look at the, the corresponding uh, um, simple module, simple uh, B modules. And, uh, and I can look at the corresponding endomorphisms over B of this simple um, modules. And of course, since they are simple modules, they are uh, division algebras, which I call D1 until Dn. Okay, so they are division algebras over my base field K. And uh, for those kind of algebras, we, have, we can actually compute their non-commutative motive. So again, it's a computation with Michel. Um, so it says the following, that if you take the motive of A or the motive of its largest semi-simple quotient, uh, the non-commutative motive does not change. It is even an integral statement. So in particular, it does not change with rational coefficients. And then if you just use uh, Artin uh, Wedderburn theorem, you know that this, this Moritz equivalent is giving you by just this division algebras here, by these division algebras. So you get a direct sum of motives like this. And now you just need to look at the center. So if you look at the center, let's call it L1 until Ln. So they become a central simple algebras over their center. And then we know that uh, for twisted uh, schemes, that there is no difference between these two non-commutative motives. So this is actually uh, so if you want in a so only here I'm using the rational coefficients, okay? And so if you want, uh, sorry, I have a question. Uh, for example, uh, by Bellinson theorem, uh, let's take uh, for simplicity the projective uh, line. Yes, and it corresponds uniquely to a quiver. Yes. Yeah, uh, the motive in your sense then, uh, how uh, does it look like? Yeah, the, the P1, it, it's even like pre as previously. So the, the, this admits a semi-orthogonal decomposition or even a full exceptional collection ah. where, where you have this. So whenever you have a, a semi-orthogonal decomposition, this is a very particular one, you know that the, the non-commutative motive of uh, P1, it's actually the non-commutative motive, sorry, the non-commutative motive of the base field plus of the base field. So yeah, if you want... Uh, the, the, theorem, the, the latter theorem, uh, for example, recovers uh, this computation for a particular quivers, for example, corresponding to projective frame. Yes, yes, and uh, more generally with relations, which you don't have here, yes. Mm. Okay, thank so you. If, as I said in my first lecture, uh, this is actually Morit equivalent to this algebra of matrices. And you see that it's upper triangular matrices. So this part vanishes somehow on the additivity. It only becomes this. And so the difference between the non-commutative world and the commutative world is precisely here. There is no tape twist. The tape twist disappears, becomes the tensor unit. If, because if you do this with the classical motive, the, here you have the tape twist. And here in the non-competitive world, we don't. Can you please say that? 
this theorem as I said. This one? For this theorem, this, we find the verb. Yes. What is the alpha is number? The number, I don't know out of the top of my head, but uh, I can give you later. Um, so as a corollary, uh, um, we get that, so if you want in a fancy language, this is just saying that finite dimensional algebras of finite global dimension, the non-commutative motive is something like a, uh, an arting motive, okay? So uh, the non-commutative conjecture for A, it's just the classical conjecture for this uh, field extensions. And uh, so this zero dimensional varieties, you know that the conjecture is true. So you get, if you put all this together, you know that this conjecture or any uh, non-commutative conjecture for A, it actually holds, okay? So all conjectures holds for this kind of algebras. So let's see, uh, for example, a uh, remark about the strong state conjecture. So suppose that C is the strong state conjecture. So in particular, I'm working over a finite field. So let me recall you that, uh, what does it say? It says that the order of uh, the, this Acevedo zeta function uh, at a zero is equal to minus the dimension of your uh, numerical K0 group. So this is the conjecture and it holds. Why? Because you see here that this, well, you know that the K0 uh, descends on non-commutative motives and uh, the non-commutative motive of this is this. And so it's just the K0 of fields and then uh, the numerical equivalence relation is not playing a role. So this is actually just a bunch of copies of K and copies of K. And on this side, uh, we know uh, exactly what is this, uh, what is this uh, zeta function? Uh, well, it's in fact given by one over uh, one minus, uh, so here, you know that uh, since we are over a finite field, uh, the Brouwer group is trivial. So in fact, you have an equality here. Uh, and so uh, you know that uh, these things are finite field extensions, which are necessarily cyclic. So this thing is just one minus, if we call this the degree of the, of the extension, so if we call the degree D1 until degree Dn, then uh, what you have is one minus T uh, D1 mod times one minus T Dn. And then what you need to do is to replace T by Q minus S. And you, we saw last time that to, you can interpret this order as precisely the algebraic multiplicity of one of this polynomial. And you see that algebraic multiplicity of that is precisely N. So you have N on both sides, okay? And maybe a remark. A remark is that this is more general uh, thanks to a recent work of Orlov. You can go slightly to the DG setting. So uh, uh, you can look at DG algebras, um, which are uh, smooth and that they are finite dimensional but in this strong sense that not the cohomology is finite dimensional, but the, the components themselves are finite dimensional, then uh, using recent work of Orlov, it can be shown that this conjecture for this kind of algebras uh, also holds. Okay, with a slightly different argument. Okay, so I think you got the feeling about these computations and now, um, I talked about these non-commutative Chow motives. I wanted to talk also about the numerical version of them. Uh, so let me just say that uh, we also have non-commutative numerical motives. So they are defined as follows. So suppose that you have an additive uh, rigid um, symmetric a monoidal category. And so, sorry, your, your font is shrinking. It's shrinking, yes, okay. I'm going to enlarge it. So you can look at this uh, 
tensor ideal. So look at the, the morphisms in this category from A to B, such that for every morphism in the converse direction uh, from B to A, um, the trace of uh, this composition is equal to zero. So this is in fact a tensor ideal in your category. And so using it, you can define this category of non-commutative numerical motives as the idempotent completion, idempotent completion of uh, the category of non-commutative Chow motives by this tensor ideal. And so we yeah. received a question. Uh, is the quasi-isomorphism invariant characterization of DGRs satisfying the strong finite dimensi uh, dimensionality condition? Uh, I don't know. I have to think. I don't. I'm not sure. I fully understood the question. Uh, you want a characterization of finite dimensionality in the sense of our love, I imagine something like that. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe I have to. Yeah. A priori, a priori, I don't have a conceptual viewpoint on these objects. Yes. If you if you want to phrase it like that, if you put them all together among all smooth proper DG categories, if I want to characterize them, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so just some facts about this category. Um, so first is that when you compute the Holmes here um, between two objects, uh, is given by the numerical uh, Grothendieck group that we saw. Uh, in the last lecture, in fact, although the definition is different, uh, it's again uh, a rigid uh, monoidal category. It's again a rigid cancer category with duals given by the opposite. And then once again, for any commutative ring, I can uh, look at the, this category with coefficients in R. Okay, so what do we know about this category, so, which is a quotient of the previous one? So we know that is, uh, it is much simpler. So it's much simpler in the following sense. So we have this theorem that if you have a field, uh, of characteristic zero, or more generally, uh, suppose that we are in a setting where the base field and the field of coefficients, they are both of positive characteristic, this works also, then uh, it turns out that this category with coefficients in, in this field is a billion semi-simple. Okay, so this naturally motivates the following question, since it's a billion semi-simple, then uh, 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 to understand this category, it's the same question as understanding uh, uh, what are the simple objects of this category? Can we classify them? And uh, secondly, uh, I, want, I need to understand the endomorphisms of these simple objects. So if I know how to answer one and two, then I know completely the category. And uh, now what I would like to explain, explain is a conditional, a conditional answer, a conditional answer to this question, uh, to this question uh, when uh, the base field is actually the, the finite field. So finite field, and let me just uh, recall that we denote by WK the ring of Wittvec of p typical Wittvec vectors, capital K, its fraction field, and by sigma, the isomorphism on capital K induced by the Frobenius on little k. And in order to explain this conditional answer, I need to talk a bit about isocrystals. Um, 
So let me uh, define a category which is a variant of the classical category of isocrystals. So you let's take this algebra, uh, capital K, with one variable of degree minus two, and look at the raw, uh, an automorphism in here that uh, uh, multiplies when you change, when you send V to uh, PV. You multiply by P, okay? And then you can look at this category, which I denote by isocrystals Z, K, V plus or minus one. So what is this? Uh, so the objects, the objects are pairs, uh, where this it's a, uh, this is a degree wise, degree wise uh, finite dimensional um, Z graded. The font is shrinking again. Okay. Uh, module over this way. Okay, so it's basically just a module over this ring and I'm asking it to be finite dimensional. Uh, so it's something Z2 graded. And then this, it is uh, uh, just an isomorphism between V where you twist by this automorphism towards V itself. And this is a sigma semilinear. Okay, and the morphisms, the morphisms are uh, what you expect. So between two gadgets like this, V and W, uh, it's just a morphism downstairs, which makes these square commutes when you put here the twist by the row. So what can we say about this kind of, uh, so these categories, morally speaking, some kind of Z2 graded isocrystals, but then it's not actually Z2 graded isocrystals because the, there is this P, this multiplication by P. It's almost that. Uh, so remarks about this category. Some important remarks is that uh, uh, this category of isocrystals over Z, um, first of all, is, is not ca capital uh, K linear, it's just uh, linear over the algebraic numbers, uh, sorry, over QP. And moreover, it's equipped, uh, it's equipped with, um, with a tensor with a tensor automorphism, automorphism, let's call it pi, of the identity functor. And uh, so if you have an object, then you have uh, an automorphism of it, uh, such that the n component is as follows. So here you have your phi n of your object, and then you need to multiply it by p n over two and then compose at R times, so R, uh, it's PR there. You need to do this when N is even, and uh, you need to multiply it by N minus one over two on the phi N and compose at R times when N is odd. And uh, so it comes equipped with this uh, tensor automorphism of the identity functor. And then we, we have the following proposition that says that the following two conditions are equivalent. So first of all, if the strong K conjecture holds for all DG categories, uh, for every uh, smooth proper uh, DG category A, that's equivalent of having this uh, isocrystal realization, in other words, uh, having a fully faithful, so a QP linear, a fully faithful um, tensor functor uh, going from the numerical motives 
with QP coefficients uh, towards this category of isocrystals. And this uh, functor uh, sends a non commutative numerical motive to its periodic cyclic homology uh, with P inverted and then uh, with the cyclotomic Frobenius. So you, uh, one way to phrase the strong Tate conjecture, if you put all uh, DG categories simultaneously, is saying that you, you actually have uh, a realization functor towards isocrystals like this. And uh, so this uh, immediately tells you, well, as a, as a corollary, of course, of this, you get that then your original category, the numerical motives, now with QP coefficients also comes equipped under this assumption with a tensor automorphism, uh, which I still denote by pi, of the identity factor. And now we can explore this tensor automorphism to try to describe this category of non commutative numerical motives. Similarly to the, in the spirit that what Janssen, uh, what the Mill did in the commutative world. So, so I just need uh, So let me just recall you the following. So if you have a, a smooth proper DG category, we look at these uh, finite dimensional capital K vector spaces. They come equipped with these automorphisms. So the Frobenius zero, which is the cyclotomic Frobenius composed R times, and similarly this one. So this Frobenius, which is this one composed R times. And I recall you that the, the Vell conjecture that we formulated last time um, was saying that if you have an eigenvalue of uh, this Frobenius, respectively of this one, then uh, what we, we ask for is that these eigenvalues are algebraic numbers, and secondly, that they're uh, complex uh, absolute value is equal to one, respectively is equal to square root of k, and this uh, for every conjugate of uh, lambda. And now we can look at a strong version of this, where you also impose a further property, uh, which is that there exists an n such that uh, when you multiply by qn your eigenvalue, you get this becomes uh, an algebraic integer. Okay, so this is a, a condition that it holds, for example, if your A is perfect on a scheme. We also have that. And this uh, is uh, classical in the literature. This is what people call uh, this notation. This is what people call the, the veil Q numbers. Uh, of weight zero, respectively, of weight zero, respectively, weight one. Okay, with all this in place, uh, now we have a conditional uh, description of our category, which is as follows. So let's assume, um, assume that this strong version of the, of the non-commutative Vell conjecture and also uh, that the strong version of the uh, Tate conjecture hold uh, for every uh, smooth and proper DG category A. Then in that case, uh, what can we say? We can say that if you, if you look at uh, um, any object in your category, with QP coefficients, uh, what you can look is uh, look at the center of the endomorphisms of that object. So clearly inside uh, of the endomorphisms, you have this element, uh, 
uh, and this element it's in the center so you can look at the smallest qp algebra containing this element so this is clearly in in the center of this algebra but it turns out that it is exactly the center of this one for any objects the center is precisely the smallest subalgebra qp subalgebra containing this endomorphism this automorphism okay which is this one okay and secondly uh, we have uh, a bijection we have a bijection so one side we can look at the simple objects uh, in our category in our abelian semi-simple category uh, and we can look at them f2 isomorphism and uh, if i have one of those when n which is simple so let me just say that of course it follows from one that if this is simple then this is a field extension okay so this will be algebraic over qp so from n you can look at this uh, pi n this object this uh, from if you have a simple object you can look at pi n okay and this pi n uh, will actually land in here in the union with i from one and two from the veil q numbers uh, of weight uh, zero respectively or of weight i sorry okay modulo and now I, you need to think of, to consider them up to an action of the absolute Galois group of qp and what i'm saying is that you actually have a bijection like this so this gives you a bijection so this answers our question our first question which was what are the simple objects conditionally they are the veil q numbers of weight i with i being zero and one yeah precisely that and then how about uh, if i have a simple object what is its algebra of endomorphisms so um it's algebra if, if you if you look um if you consider a simple uh non-commutative numerical motif so what can we do so uh, just one remark here so uh, we have this uh, so we have this uh, non-archimedian um, local field uh, so we have this uh, since it's simple i have this uh, non-archimedian local fields so i can look at this brower group and i can consider the as uh, invariant of it and this gives you an isomorphism with q mod z so we can uh, evaluate this look at the invariant on the endomorphisms of n so endomorphisms of n it's actually a division algebra over a qp of this so uh, and you know that the brower group classifies division algebras so if you knew this invariant you immediately know what is this completely classifies it and this is given by minus so here you have the periodic valuation of pn here you have the periodic valuation of q multiplication by the uh, degree of this field extension qp and you have to consider this in q mod z so uh, so that gives you a complete description of your category of non-commutative numerical motives but the conditional one uh, where you are assuming these two things in fact uh, yes okay uh, maybe i just would like to say that the talk tomorrow uh, will be in the same spirit so i will use that uh, non-commutative viewpoint to attack commutative examples and to prove the conjecture in new cases and then at the very end i will talk about uh, the riemann hypothesis and uh, the non-commutative version of the riemann hypothesis okay thank you for your time okay uh, many thanks let's thank uh, gonzalo uh, any questions yeah so i i have a question so uh it seems that uh, Chokunet decomposition, for example, of classical Chow motifs 
are sent to uh, over decompositions, but uh, you lose weights, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. For example, the composition of, of Pn will be just a sum of a, a, a unit object. So do you really completely lose weights in the non-commutative motifs or is there a way to, to recover the weight filtration, things like that? Uh, I mean, on the category level, uh, of course, uh, on the category level, you still see something there. For example, uh, if you just take P1 and you take the two line bundles, O and O1, so mm -hmm. you have one X in one direction, which is dimension two, for example. So you still have information and, uh, but as soon as you go to any invariant, which is additive, you lose the extension because it's like K0. K0 is the machine that doesn't see extensions, treats all extensions as the trivial one. So as long as, as soon as you do any kind of additive procedure, the type disappear. Okay. And, and in somehow the non-commutative motives is the universal way to, to make this additivity. It's the initial way to do it, like any other way will factor uniquely. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, Gonzalo, another question to you. Uh, yes. Could you say a word on how the description differs from uh, the classical draw motive version? Ah, uh, you mean this theorem? Possibly. You mean, you mean the comparison with the commutative world? That's what you are asking? Uh, Remy, could you please uh, write uh, something on that? So yes, I can. I can absolutely say something there. So uh, uh, Gonzalo, the explicit description of the last theorem. Yes. So let me. Uh, I was about to say something about the comparison between what I did and what happens in the commutative world. Is this is of, of interest to you? Is I'm not answering, is not that? Uh, no, let me just yes, say it's a, yes, so, I'm sorry, yes. I was just saying that so you divide the world in two. On one side, you have smooth and proper schemes over the base field. On the other world, you have DG categories which are smooth and proper. And you can pass from one side to the other in a contravariant way. Because if you have a scheme, you can look at this category. Okay. But then on this side, you have Grotendieck. He defined uh, this, uh, this functor towards, uh, uh, so this contravariant functor towards numerical motives. Let's say that I'm working with Q coefficients. So inside here, I have, and then on the, this side, I can have this non commutative version of that where I go towards non-commutative uh, numerical motives with Q coefficients. And so the comparison between the two is as follows. In here, you have a tensor invertible object, which is the, the Tate motive. So tensoring with this object, it's an automorphism of this category. So one thing that you can do is that you can trivialize that action in the sense that you can do an orbit category. So you can do this. So in this category, the 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 tight twists becomes the tensor unit. So uh, another uh, concrete description of this category, if you want, is that here the home spaces are given by correspondence of a, a precise uh, co-dimension, and here you are putting all the co-dimensions together on the home spaces. But since you are working with Q coefficients, this is just a category where the home spaces are just the K0 homes, if you want, as defined, for example, in Manin's paper. And then uh, it turns out that this embeds here by a functor, which is uh, fully faithful. And uh, this embedding uh, is nothing but uh, the grotendieck riemann rock theorem to guarantee that you actually have functoriality, et cetera. So this is the comparison. He's saying, well, um, if you trivialize the Tate motive, it becomes the tensor unit, then after making this trivialization, it embeds fully faithfully in here. Okay. Now, under these assumptions, if you assume these conjectures, these very strong conjectures, they are going to tell you, well, you also know that this is a billion semi-simple. This is a billion semi-simple. 
And uh, here I'm saying that these are the simple objects are the value numbers of weight zero and one, and Milne proved that these are the value numbers of arbitrary weight. So in fact, under the, those conjectures, which are pretty strong, they would imply that this functor is not only fully faithful, but moreover essentially surjective, that it's an equivalence. Then the, the non-commutative world, uh, it's in fact just a, a trivialization of the tape motif of the commutative world. But this is conditional under those assumptions. So morally speaking, this is saying that uh, if you assume the strong tape conjecture, everything is controlled by the Frobenius. And then if you force the eigenvalues of the Frobenius to be very close to what happens with the commutative world, well, then actually everything comes from the commutative world. That's the idea behind of it. And then you have a similar picture for Chow motives, etc. And then you have a similar picture, as I mentioned yesterday, for the for the mixed case, where here you have Voivodsky uh, DM. Maybe that's more interesting to you. Let me just say you can take smooth schemes and you go to DM with, uh, and you do exactly the same thing. Here you have the the tape motive, and uh, you can uh, do the orbit category of this. So you can uh, trivialize this action of tensoring with this tape motive, and that and that's fully faithful in this uh, non-commutative uh, mixed motive. So, okay. morally speaking, the, the difference between it's always the tape motives. We lose the the the, the weights. Uh, Gonzalo, another question: uh, Do the conjectures imply that all non-commutative motives over finite fields possibly are actually geometric? Uh, so, what what geometric means? Uh, you mean that it comes from here? I imagine that. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, so that's that's exactly what I said. I said that uh, these conjectures, these two. Uh, uh, so what? Okay. Maybe I, I don't know if you, if you if if it was clear what I said. I'm just saying that uh, every if we assume those two conjectures and work over a finite field and with cubic coefficients, then you actually have the, an equivalence here. So saying that every gadget here, it's actually coming from the commutative world, okay? But it's very strong uh, under those uh, conjectures and over QP coefficients. Okay, uh, thank you. TP decomposes as a direct sum of the drum after uh, rationalization. Uh, okay. Do you have any commutative, an non-commutative analog? So, uh, the answer the question is hmm. so uh, what your colleague is saying is that tp of this uh, it's actually th uh, this uh, So if I understand correctly, your colleague is saying this. Yes, it's true. And now you want me to put here a A and to have a decomposition in two pieces. That's what he is suggesting. Uh, well, uh, it's a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, so I think, morally speaking, I think you can try to do something like that if you have extra structure, for example, some kind of tensor. Yeah, but if you have some kind of tensor and if the tensor is commutative, you are morally m much closer to the commutative setting. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think you need the extra structure to try to, to develop some kind of uh, um, lambda operations and things like that to try to, to do the splittings. Another question. Previously, you mentioned that in some theorem, uh, rationalization is not necessary. Do you mean that you have more controls on things like uh, Nygaard's filtration, maybe 
coming from the S1 action? Uh, yes, I think you don't need to invert P in that case. You don't think, I don't think, uh, I, if you don't invert P, you actually have a, a filtration, yes. But as soon as you invert P, then uh, you have this canonical splitting, yeah. So I think filtrations exist without inverting P. If, if I remember correctly, yes. Uh, and uh, the last question, should this be over more general fields as well? But uh, that was the question. Uh, What is the question? Uh, Mikhail, can, uh, can you formulate your question, please? Uh, so what, what fields do you suspect that all non-commutative motives come from smooth projective varieties? I mean, I, I don't know. These conjectures that I'm assuming are pretty strong. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I definitely, as soon as you are outside a finite field, I don't know even how to start. If you are over a finite field, you have this Frobenius, and uh, using this Frobenius, you have some kind of uh, classification. So you can, and uh, using that that classification, you can try can try to compare it with the commutative world. But uh, besides that, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I expect that not to be true. That. Uh, there are much more things here uh, that do not come from here, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions to Bansala? Uh, if not, let's thank uh, Bansala again. <laughs>